gone, we'd miss all that honey. The United States produces 200 million pounds of honey every year. But far more importantly, our crops would not be pollinated. The fowl brood begins to grow in the larvae and it kills it. Genetic science to the rescue of the honeybee. The directions for a human being are written in code, three billion letters long. These instructions tell our bodies how to live, how to grow, how to die. Researchers call this code the sequence. Welcome to Secrets of the Sequence. I'm Lucky Severson. When I think of honeybees, I think about two things. Bee stings, which I don't want to think about, and honey, which I do like to think about. I'm not the only one. Americans consume honey by the truckload. 7,125 honey tanker truckloads a year, to be exact. But the busy bees who cough up that sweet liquid gold are apparently in danger. So now, scientists are turning to genetics to build a better bee. You may not have noticed it, but wild beehives have almost entirely vanished from the North American landscape. Most colonies now live in man-made hives under the watchful eyes of beekeepers. What is preying upon these colonies? Not honey-hungry raccoons or bears, but foreign microscopic invaders introduced here from overseas. Surprisingly, the honeybee is also an import introduced to the United States by early settlers. There's some early writing by Thomas Jefferson where he tells that the Native Americans referred to the honeybee as white man's fly because of their association with the settlers. When they saw these honeybees or white man's fly, they knew settlers were within several miles. When most people think of honeybees, they associate it with honey. The United States produces around 200 million pounds of honey every year. However, the real importance of the honeybee to U.S. agriculture is as pollinators of a wide variety of crops, uh, from apples and almonds to squashes, uh, citrus, cranberries and blueberries. Overall, the added value of honeybee pollination to U.S. agriculture is estimated at nearly $15 billion. Commercial beekeepers truck thousands of beehives to farms throughout the year to pollinate fruits and vegetables. Loss of the honeybee would be catastrophic for American agriculture. So there is an all-out war to protect the honeybee from more than a dozen diseases and predators that are on the attack. At the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Bee Research Laboratory in Beltsville, Maryland, scientists are working to save the honeybee from a deadly bacterial invader. There is some brood there. It's called foul brood disease. The name comes from the foul odor the bacteria produces in a hive. Just a few miles away from the bee lab's healthier colonies, Jeff Pettis has the task of maintaining the disease colonies. These quarantined hives contain the bees that will be used in the quest to create a genetic resistance to foul brood disease. We like to think of things as individuals. With honeybee colonies, you can't. You have to think of, this is one, kind of one individual. I mean, it's a hive has a single queen, but all these workers are working and they can't live alone. Like if I take this bee in isolator, take her off, she can't survive overnight, she'll freeze to death. So they only exist because they, they live as a colony. Even inside a hive infected with foul brood disease, the bees go about their business. The female workers regulate temperature by beating their wings, protect and care for the queen and her offspring and produce their food supply, which is honey. This is all sealed, the honey is all sealed, and part of that is just to, it keeps any excess moisture. Once they've dried it down and removed the moisture, it keeps that out, and then as they need it through the winter, they'll open it up. But in fact, I mean, there is honey under there. That's, and they'll, they'll repair the damage that I just did. But in the same hive, Jeff finds the effects of foul brood disease. Um, 
I've just uncapped this cell, and what the queen came along and laid an egg in that cell. The larvae, when it was less than 24 hours old, as it just began beginning to feed, it ingested some of these foul brood spores. The foul brood begins to grow in the in the larvae, and it it in fact kills it. And so what we're looking at is one that has just succumbed to the disease. So it's just a dead dead bee in the larval stage that we're looking at. As more larvae die, the weakened colony soon becomes a target for invading honey-robbing bees who will carry the disease to their own hive. Foul brood can be treated by mixing antibiotics with powdered sugar, which the bees ingest. But because these drugs are banned when the honey will be eaten by humans and the bacteria are building up a resistance, scientists are turning to genetics for help. Turns out that some honeybees are genetically programmed to detect foul brood. Scientists hope to isolate those genes. They do have a, a genetic response in producing antibiotics that, that are effective against the pathogen. And we're trying to identify those products and see if bees differ in their, in their ability to mount what's essentially an immune response to this pathogen. Might honeybees someday be genetically re-engineered to develop immunity to foul brood? To study the genetic underpinnings of bees' response to foul brood, the pupa are tested by actually injecting them with the disease. After exposing the bee larva to disease, we collect larvae after 12 and 24 hours, which is the time when we found that they're maximally responding to that disease genetically. We measure the actual amounts of RNA for specific genes involved in the immune response and then correlate those levels of RNA with those found in bees that were not exposed to the disease and therefore are able to see how much the bees respond to a particular disease or stress. It's a process of elimination, finding which genes are turned on or off and ultimately which genes or gene triggers an immunity to foul brood. So far, we have learned that individual bees differ from each other in their ability to mount a response to this bacterial disease. And we are now attempting, attempting to establish whether that's based on their genotype or their parentage or simply based on other aspects of their environment. Given the many challenges that are facing bees right now, we're hoping to use these genomic tools to provide another mechanism to produce healthier honeybees and also to affect the management of bees in a way that, that helps their survival against these diseases. But after millions of years of evolution, can they survive the confrontation with the secret TV crew? Certainly, this is not a gene that we want to amplify or, or, uh, or, or increase, uh, but it does serve a purpose. Within a few months, researchers will have mapped the honeybee genome. As is the case with mapping the genome of other animals, the bee map could lead to a better understanding of human health and reproduction. But of equal importance, it will help in the fight to preserve the honeybee, which plays a crucial role as a pollinator of so many of our food crops. The Secrets of the Sequence teaching materials were developed at Virginia Commonwealth University with funding from the National Academy of Sciences and the Pfizer Foundation. The original public television series, Secrets of the Sequence, was produced by Ward Television with funding from Pfizer, the Pfizer Foundation, Oracle, and the Council for Biotechnology Information. Special thanks to member institutions of the series advisory board, consisting of Virginia Commonwealth University, Harvard University, University of Wisconsin, University of Michigan, University of California at San Francisco, and the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology, Cambridge, England.